So we are continuing our sermon series called Living on the Promises of God, I Promise. And I invite you, if you would like, to take out your sermon notes page, which is on the other side of your bulletin. And if you can, eventually I'm going to make a couple points so you can fill in those there. Last week, Pastor Ken introduced us to Moses, and he shared with us a bit of his life and his challenge, his, his struggle with learning who God was. As we read uh, our scripture today, it's from chapter 34. There's a big difference between chapter 3, where Pastor Ken was last week, and pa- chapter 34, where I'm going to be speaking from this morning. And a lot of that activity that happens is important context to understand. So I'm going to walk us through 31 chapters of Exodus, but I'm going to use a little bit of help. I'm going to use some images as I summarize. Okay, this isn't going to be doing justice. This isn't a Bible study. Uh, But to summarize, God's call and Moses' response and the response of the covenant people of God, Israel. And I'm going to use some images from the Brick Testament. Uh, You may or may not know what the Brick Testament is, but it's Lego, guys. So Moses and the bush of flame. This was on Mount Horeb, the, the mountain of God. And it was God back then who was made, made, known, made himself known exclusively to Moses on the mountain. And you might remember at the end of the scripture that Ken read last week, God said, I will be with you. He made a promise. And this is the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So that was the promise of God. Well, then God also shared his new name, which was Yahweh. Yahweh was revealed, which we understand to mean I am who I am, I will be who I will be, and I am promises this rescue from slavery. And he gives Moses some important signs that he will need to demonstrate to the people so that they'll believe it was God who sent him. So he goes to the people and he tells them in Egypt, his people, Israel, that God has sent me and he's going to give us freedom. And so uh, let's all get together. Well, Pharaoh hears this and he says, no, let's make things harder. So Pharaoh makes life more difficult for the Israelites. He gives them no straw to make bricks. And the people tell Moses, you have done nothing but bring us trouble. Well, then God says, no, continue, Moses. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go so they will worship me. But Pharaoh won't deny it, and there will be plagues after each one. And so there are these nine plagues. I won't summarize them, but you know what they are. And each time Moses says, let my people go so that they will worship me on this mountain. And when Pharaoh denies it, then there is a consequence for the people. And it is then the tenth plague of the firstborn, where the firstborn of all the people that are located in Egypt will be killed unless they have the blood of the Passover lamb over their doorpost. And God gives instructions for the Israelites to celebrate Passover. And they do this, and then it is time for them finally to escape. Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. And the water is divided for their escape. And as they escape Egypt, they cross this water. And it is then that Pharaoh changes his mind and the Egyptians begin to pursue the people. And when the people get to the other side, the waters come back and those Egyptians are drowned. It is then in the wilderness that the people of God are provided for. The great I am, Yahweh, provides food in the manna and in the quail and water. And then eventually Moses goes to Mount Sinai. Many believe that Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same place, and so it is the place where God lived at that top there, the presence of God. And he goes to the top of Mount Sinai and he receives the stone tablets, the law of the covenant. And what we know about covenants in that day is that you would have different types of covenants depending on the type of power dynamic between the people. And there's such a thing that's called a suzerain covenant. 
And a suzerain was kind of like the superpower. And it would be like the superpower making a covenant with someone who was a lesser power, a subordinate group or a subordinate power. And in this case, there would be a covenant made and there would be two copies made of that covenant. Each party would retain one. Well, in this case, the design was that Moses would take both copies. So whenever it says that there are two stone tablets, it's not like, like there are five commandments on one and five on the other. It's they were two copies of the exact same covenant, but one was God's copy and one was the people's copy. And they were to be kept among the people, signifying the presence of God with them. But meanwhile, while Moses was up on the mountain, the people forgot this great I am, and they worshipped a golden calf idol. And Moses saw this and was extremely angry. His anger burned. And so what did Moses do? He threw the tablets out of his hands and he broke them to pieces. Moses sees these people running wild and he calls for those who are for Yahweh, not against him, to come to him. And they come to Moses and then they pick up swords and they begin to eliminate the problem people who are running around. Moses says, you have committed a great sin to his people, but now I will go back up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And so Moses goes back up the mountain and he pleads for his people. He pleads for God's help to him in particular as a leader. He says, teach me your ways so that I may know you and find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. You see, all the other gods of the ancient East would seek to exact justice and retribution, but in this case, we see Israel's God remains present. It commits to sticking around, to be present at the very center of their worship. And so when the instructions are given to build the tabernacle, that presence of God is signified, represented by those two tablets being stored in that box, the special box called the Ark of the Covenant. And Moses continues, if your presence is not with us, please don't send us away. How will the people of the world know you are with your people and that you are pleased with your people unless you go with us and that you are present? There are most amazing things. And he went from, Moses went from the fearful man before the burning bush to coming to God now and saying this. Now, show me your glory. This is not a small ask for Moses. Because if you see God's glory, it is overwhelming and magnificent. It's kind of like trying to look straight into the sun from the surface of Mercury. No one could actually survive to look God in the face. But God responds, yes. And he says, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, and when I pass by you, I will cover you with my hand. And Jesus, I'm sorry, and Moses experiences the glory of God, though he's not able to look into it. And he's still on the mountain, and when it comes to the passage that I'm going to read this morning, Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. Let us read it together. And so then the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets, like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets, like the first ones. And he went up on Mount Sinai, early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried these two stone tablets in his hands. And then Yahweh came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh, I am. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, I am Yahweh, Yahweh, I am 
the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. God, we thank you for this reading of your word, and we pray now that in my meditations and in the meditations of each of our hearts, Lord, you would give us stability and strength, for you are our rock and our redeemer, in whom we trust. Amen. Do hard things. It's actually a book that's been recently written, and it's kind of subtitle is this, A Teenage Rebellion Against Low Expectations. There's this sense that among young people today, and maybe all people today, that there's a reluctance to try hard things because there's a possibility of failure. My dad used to say, why do things the easy way when you can do it the hard way? Which is kind of funny when you think about it. We'd all rather do things the easy way, wouldn't we, if we have a choice? But I've got an example of where I like the hard way. So I drive a 10-year-old Honda, and in the last couple weeks, there's been this noise coming from the rear door lock. It's this buzzing noise. It's a buzzing noise that sounds like I've answered an incorrect question on a game show. (laughs) Every time I lock the door, people are looking at me because they've heard this and they know this this sound. I lock the door. (laughs) And the great thing about my Honda is that when I drive up to 10 miles per hour, immediately the door locks. The door locks lock. Okay, It's an automatic thing. I don't have control over it. It just does it. It's kind of a safety feature. But if I'm not ready for it, if I'm not paying attention, I can just be starting to drive in my car and all of a sudden I hit 10 miles an hour. (laughs) I've been suffering PTSD from this. (laughs) Pastor Andy can tell you, we went on a drive, we went to lunch and I drove and he sat in the back and I even warned him, I said, my car makes noises, be prepared. And sure enough, (laughs) and every time I hit the door lock, it makes that noise. And so what? Andy started talking, and it actually came in handy because he was saying something, and I just say, "Eh, eh, eh." (laughs) So to fix, and and so the problem with, with this is that it is a bad rear door actuator, lock actuator. And so this would be the easy thing. The easy thing would be for me to take it to the garage and pay $300 for them to fix it. Why do things easy when you can do it the hard way? Because the hard way, $70 for the part, and I can do it myself. And so yesterday, I and my special assistant, who is from Generation Z and knows how to operate YouTube, in under two hours, we fixed that lock actuator. Do hard things. Sometimes it's hard to do hard things. Sometimes it's good to do hard things. But it's important that we realize failure is always an option. Sometimes we have to go through hard things. And that survival is the goal. Some of you may be wondering why I am bearded. Well, I started October 1st. This is kind of my annual deal. I start growing something on October 1st. 
and I shave it off on December 1st. And it is because this time of year, two years ago, I went to my doctor because I noticed something different. There was something different in my body, and I didn't know what it was, and I needed my doctor's advice. And it was within two weeks that I had surgery for testicular cancer. I had to do a hard thing. And it turned out that in that uh, process, I was cured of that cancer. It did not spread. But still, I have a yearly, every, actually an every six-month reminder of this hard thing when I go and get scanned, when I go and get followed up. And those of you who have been through cancer or have been with someone who has been through cancer understand the new routine, the new timeline that exists for those who have to do the hard thing of suffering and battling cancer. And so I grow this every year about this time simply for solidarity with other brothers of mine who maybe didn't go to the doctor or who maybe die of other preventable illnesses that are unique to men, like mental illness, suicide, certain men's cancers. They call it No Shave November. So on December 1st, which was the anniversary of my surgery, coincidentally, I'll shave it off, much to the joy of my wife. <laughs> Moses had to do a hard thing. He knew what he had done. He had done something out of anger, and it was because it was prompted by the anger of his people. And it's one of those things when we do something out of emotion, sometimes we immediately regret it. I can imagine that's what Moses was thinking when he broke those stone tablets. But he knew he had to do the hard thing, and he went up back to the mountain because he had been called by God to do this specific task of freeing the people from the Egyptians so that they would become his covenant people. God's covenant with Israel was everything to them. He identified with his people as partners in the grand purpose of extending God's shalom, blessing, and salvation to all the nations of the world. That was the goal. And Moses knew this was important. And when we, as Jesus followers, understand our role in this, we, we understand that Jesus establishes the new covenant. And what he does when he does that is he actually fulfills the responsibility of the people of God to keep their end of the deal because the people of Israel found that they couldn't. Jesus is the obedient one who demonstrates God's goodness to the world. Jesus is the firstborn an unblemished lamb of God whose blood is the only needed atonement for sin. Jesus himself, from the line of King David, is the true king of all creation. Moses demonstrates to us how God's covenant people are to live in the world. And, his first, and my first point today is this that God's covenant people first seek intimacy with God. And when I say intimacy, I don't mean something soft and lacy and romantic. I mean something closer to a relationship, that God's people seek a relationship with God that provides truth and assurance and stability and encourage to do difficult things. To do difficult things for our glory, no, for God's glory. In Moses' anger with his people, he did this thing that broke the covenant, let's say, literally broke the covenant in pieces. But he was living on the promises of God. And he went back up that mountain, and he had an intimacy of trust in God to that point where he asks to see the full glory of God. Yahweh intended his covenant and his covenant's presence among the people of God in that Ark of the Covenant to be the center of worship and community life in Israel. 
God intended to be the present one who was always at the center and with the people. And whenever the people left in the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant would go before them, it was God's very presence represented in that Ark that would be the presence leading them wherever it was that they would go, ultimately to the promised land. And what we understand today as followers of Jesus is that while we don't have an Ark of the Covenant that symbolizes this presence of God, we have the Holy Spirit who has been gifted to us, to live in us as the presence of a holy God in us. What is more intimate than to receive the Holy Spirit in such a way that we are then known in a way that is greater than any person can know us? That this is a trustworthy spirit, that this is the God who created us and will not leave us forsaken or the way that we were or will not leave us in our struggles, will not lead us, leave us in our doubts. And so Moses took a risk, and it took faith, but he had learned to trust God, which leads to the second point, that God's covenant people trust in God's character. A major hang-up that many people have with believing or trusting in God is that they're not sure of God's character. Is God really good? Is God really kind? Is God really loving? And we hear this explanation of who God is in Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7. As as God passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is the true character definition of God, that God is love. We know that. And yet sometimes it's hard for us to trust in that love because we look around and we wonder, well, why isn't God working everything out? Except that our perspectives are always limited You see, the covenant isn't between equal superpowers, that God is a superpower and we are a superpower, and so we've got an equal status, and that we can demand things of God, and that God can demand things of us, and we can go back and forth in a power struggle. No. The relationship is between us, a created one who is limited, who cannot see all things, and the superpower who is God, whose character is love and faithfulness, who is trustworthy who is good and holy and sovereign. And because of this goodness and this holiness and the sovereignty of God, the next part is true also. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents of the third and fourth generation. And that's a hard sentence to swallow. We don't like that idea. It seems like God's vengeful in some way, except that when we understand this in context, when we compare this also to the language that's in Exodus 20 in describing the Ten Commandments, he says that he punishes those who are guilty and who hate him. That there's a consequence for hating God. And this consequence is merely three or four generations, not the thousands of generations that God promises to those who love him. And so we can understand by comparison that God's love is far greater than we can understand ever the consequences of our evil and wickedness. But there is a consequence. We see this statement of God's character, and it's often repeated in the Bible. If you want to know what God is like, this is where you look, that God is love. Now, our culture is very law-oriented, individual rights-oriented, but our rights are limited when it comes to God. We are limited to the sovereign will and plan of God, which doesn't always go, we think, according to our plans. But what motivated God to initiate things with Moses in the first place with that flaming bush? He heard the cries of his people, and he hears the cries of his people today. God has compassion, and he acts. Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's covenant love and faithfulness expressed through his grace, through his obedience, through his death on the cross, 
for his resurrection to new life, to his ascension to sit at the right hand of God, and his sending of the Spirit to be at our presence with us. Which leads to the third point, that God's covenant people are shaped by grace and gratitude. God's people are shaped by grace and gratitude. Grace is unmerited and overwhelmingly generous. Gratitude is always a response of thankfulness to grace, marked by our transformation, by which we are desiring a greater intimacy with God, and whereby we begin to reflect the character. We begin to look like this generous, loving God who created us. And that is our purpose. The very next line, after the passage that we read in verse 10 of chapter 34, it says that Yahweh said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. And that promise continues. That when we place our trust in this awesome God, he continues to show up and he continues to show his goodness and his faithfulness. And he does miracles every day if we have eyes to see. He is present to us and with us. And much later on, we see that God's purpose wasn't just for Moses, it was for all of his people. Much later on in the book, in chapter 36, we see a new, a new uh, activity that's going on. The people of Israel have heard this new, new good news. They've received the instructions for building the tabernacle, for how they will worship and how they will live in gratitude to their God. And they begin to bring together their gifts to do the work of God. And it says, all the skilled workers who were doing the work of the sanctuary were left to what they were doing, and they said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses gave an order, and he sent word throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. When we come together as the covenant people of God, we all have a responsibility to share in the work that God has called us to do through the local church. And when we come and we dedicate and we consecrate our financial commitments, this is what we're doing. And when we respond to God's faithfulness, we realize it's not out of obligation, but it is out of gratitude for God's grace that we do this. This is an act of worship, and it is God's generosity being transformed in us because we were created to give as God gives. It's not that we give till it hurts. No, we give until it feels good. Even though sometimes it's hard. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your goodness and for your grace, for your love and your faithfulness that is greater and exceeds that of any human. We submit ourselves to this goodness and grace today. And we ask, Lord, for your leading, your inspiration, for the freedom, God, not to please you or to impress you, but, Lord, for the freedom to act in the way that you created us to act, with overwhelming joy and gratitude and generosity. And Lord, for some of us, it's hard right now for us, and, and so we bring all of our lives to you, Lord, not just the good parts where we are overflowing with gratitude, but we bring to you our brokenness. We bring to you our needs. We bring to you our lack of resources, maybe, that we perceive. And we pray, O oh God, that in your economy we would see that you are an abundant and generous God, and that in your kingdom there is no scarcity. We bring ourselves today, Lord. Will you bless and honor our worship as we give you glory and receive your glory? In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.